things were different yesterday. We're calling it Black Saturday. We keep enthusiasts doing the brave before sight of Sabre. And chase the lads away. Imagine yourself back in Musselburgh in the late summer of 1547. Henry VIII of England is six months dead, and in his place the country is effectively ruled by the Duke of Somerset, regent for Henry's son, the nine-year-old Edward VI. Somerset has vowed to continue Henry's obsession to force the marriage of Edward to four-year-old Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scots. However, the campaign of military harassment, known as the Rough Wooing, has so far failed to convince the Scots Parliament, and the match is certainly resolutely opposed by Mary's mother, the formidable Maria de Guise. However, rumours are rife that Somerset is advancing on Scotland with a huge army which includes continental mercenaries with state-of-the-art weaponry. On September the 4th, Somerset crosses the border into Scotland, accompanied along the coast by a number of warships, and proceeds to march past Dunbar towards Musselburgh. His aim is twofold, to install English rule in southern Scotland and to force the marriage on the Scots, thereby uniting the crowns of the two kingdoms. Here at Atchison's Haven there are the best harbour facilities of the time between Dunbar and Leith, and it's here that the English station their supply vessels and unload the troops who march about a mile up the hill to make camp at Goshen Farm. The Scots, under the command of the regent, the Earl of Arne, have mustered some 26,000 men and position themselves behind me here on the steep west bank of the River Esk stretching southwards from Musselburgh. This strong defensive position commands a view of the English approach and, strategically, of the Roman bridge, the only crossing point between Dalkeith and the sea. To reach Edinburgh, the English must cross here. To the south of Musselburgh, the battle lines are constrained by Pinky Cluch. This long cleft running down virtually to the coast, and by the Howe Mire, a marshy area below the hill surmounted by Fawside Castle. Firm open ground lies between here and the road between Carberry and Inveresk. However, this particular confrontation is to be anything but traditional. The whole art of warfare is about to change. For the very first time on these islands, a land-based army is about to be attacked by sea-based artillery. Somerset's naval force is well equipped with cannon capable of reaching the shore. In particular, a 200-ton ship known as the Subtle Galley is a formidable gun platform. Her main armament is a full-size cannon with a 12-foot barrel capable of firing a 20-pound shot over two kilometres, and she also carries 30 somewhat smaller weapons and 50 handguns. This will allow the English to bombard the north flank of the Scots, and it will do so with devastating effect. We're here on the top of Fawside Castle, the most prominent landmark in the area both in 1547 and today. From here we can see the site of the entire battle from the Scots camp in the west to the English camp in the east. This castle was manned by a tiny garrison who did their best to attack the English forces as they advanced, but to no avail. For their efforts, Somerset burned the castle to the ground the following day, killing everyone inside. We can be fairly certain then that this area here represented the theatre of war between the two armies, with the Scots advancing from the west and the English advancing from their position at Goshen Farm in the east. The day dawns, 
September the 10th, heavily overcast, the day which will become known as Black Saturday, following the slaughter of 10,000 Scots, most of them fleeing from the battle. The Scots have one artillery position on the east side of the river, on what's later to be known as Oliver's Mount, close to St Michael's Church. It commands a panoramic view of the terrain between the armies, but is inevitably one of the main targets for Somerset to capture. Arran recognises the superiority of the English field artillery, and to neutralise its effectiveness and support the position on Oliver's Mount, he abandons his position of strength to advance on the English lines. The Scottish army crosses the river and marches up through Inveresk to confront the enemy. It is at this stage that the offshore galley opens fire from the north on the Scots' left flank. The closely packed pikemen and highland archers are cut down twenty or thirty at a time. What is left of them tries desperately to move southwards out of range of the cannon. The troops find themselves mixed up with the middle flank. The ensuing chaos does nothing to help the Scottish commanders. Somerset, alarmed by the Scottish advance to higher ground, throws a hastily prepared cavalry charge against the Scots' right flank, which consists of well-drilled pikemen. The horsemen, without their full equipment, are badly damaged by the Scottish 18-foot long pikes and fall back, but the tactic succeeds in that it halts the Scottish advance. The Scottish pikemen are now exposed and at the mercy of the continental mercenaries with their modern harquebusers, and also vulnerable to the English archers. Visibility across the battlefield, already poor due to the low cloud, suffers further with the smoke of the artillery fire from both sides. Confusion reigns in the Scottish ranks. Some of the most exposed are already in retreat. More and more throw down their weapons, some of these no more than farm implements, and run. The remnants of the English cavalry, still stinging from their earlier mauling, pursue the fleeing Scots infantry and cut them down as they run. Pursuit is carried on as far as Dalkeith. The river Esk runs red with blood. Some 10,000 Scots are killed compared to a few hundred English. Eventually Somerset, perhaps shocked at the extent of the carnage, calls his troops back. The battle is over. He makes his camp here in Lewisville Park at the edge of the battlefield. This stone here was raised to commemorate Somerset's being here. Although Bloody Saturday was the 10th of September, so whoever raised it managed to get the date wrong by one day. It's the last battle, and arguably the bloodiest, ever fought between the two kingdoms. And it's all been for nothing. The infant Mary is smuggled off to France, eventually to marry the young Dauphin. And while the English occupy Harrington and a few other places, they find that the cost of occupation and the constant harrying by the Scots and their French allies is too high. Somerset is deposed and his successor abandons the occupation. The futility of the whole episode is underlined only 56 years later, when the kingdoms of England and Scotland are finally united without further bloodshed by the accession of Mary's son, James VI, to the English throne. The names of only 200 of the 10,000 who fell were ever recorded. Now every year on that date, the names of twenty are read out during the commemoration of the battle by the old Musselburgh Club. Then pancake look, my field tail look, something body strewn up it. Dealers fairly cast this clue on Scotland's day old when the river is grand.